Today's lecture is about error correcting codes. It's a very important topic in CS theory. Uh, you could teach a whole course on it. And indeed, uh, Professor Venkat Guruswamy periodically does teach a whole course on it here at CMU. Uh, we'll only get one lecture on it. But it's a nice application of uh, some of the things we talked about last time, polynomials and finite fields. So uh, the goal of error correcting codes is to cleverly uh, find a system whereby you can take some data that you want to either store or transmit and cleverly add some redundancy to it so that even if there are um, corruptions, errors, like some of the bits or bytes in your message plus redundancy get corrupted or altered, you can still recover what the original message was. This uh, topic is studied in several different areas, including uh, electrical engineering and uh, information theory and theoretical computer science. And in the first two areas, um, they tend to focus on probabilistic or randomized models for errors. And in theoretical computer science, they tend to focus on worst case models for errors. And uh, so this being a CS theory course, we'll focus on the latter, at least in this lecture. But both are important. OK, so let's dive in. What is an error correcting code? Uh, it's somewhat of a long definition. So an error correcting code, ECC is how I'll abbreviate it here. It's, um, it's a map. It's an injective map that explains how to encode the data. And I'll call this map uh, enc for encode. And it maps strings of length k over some alphabet sigma to strings of length n over the same alphabet, where OK, there are several things to add here. First of all, um, Sigma is the alphabet, sort of the symbols for the messages and their encoding. Okay, And we'll often write a Q for the cardinality of sigma. And Q is often, but not always, 2. Okay, If you're transmitting bits and bytes, then it'll be, or bits, then it'll be 2. But if you think of um, your data packaged into bytes or larger packets, then sigma might be larger. Uh, the set of all possible things you might send, sigma to the k, is called the message space. And uh, this parameter k is called the message length, or the sometimes called the dimension, for reasons we'll see soon. OK, so that's the input. The encoding mapping is encoding some message of length k. Uh, the output length n is called just the length or the block length. This will naturally be uh, at least as large as k. We're not trying to uh, compress anything here. And furthermore, um, we're going to specifically be interested in the range of this encoding map, so all the possible things that it may output. And we'll call that set of you know, n character strings C. And this is sometimes called the code itself. So um, sometimes by a bit of abuse of notation or terminology, we don't distinguish too much between the encoding and just the set of outputs of the encoding map. These are called the code words. OK, so any string which is actually inside this uh, set C is called a code word. OK, so generally n will be bigger than k. So uh, the set of all outputs of the encoding function is like a sparse subset of all possible uh, length n strings. And finally, there's some parameters associated to a code, and one of which is uh, k over n, which is called the rate of the code. And this is something that we want to be large. OK, so this will be some number that's between 0 and 1. And uh, sort of the smaller it is, the more redundancy you're adding. So ideally, k will be very close to n. So n will be not much bigger than k. Uh, so you're not adding too much redundancy, so it's efficient. And uh, in that case, the rate will be close to 1. Uh, OK. So the picture here, to sort of draw a picture, is uh, we start with some message x that uh, the sender wants to send, or the person that's storing data for the future wants to store. 
And this is a string of length k over this alphabet sigma. And then we imagine that we encode it using this map. And we get a code word y. This is a string of length n. OK, but the reason we don't just uh, you know, set n to be k and set the encoding function to be the identity function is that we're anticipating that uh, there'll be some uh, corruptions when we try to send y to a receiver or when we try to read back y at a later date if we're storing. So what we imagine is that there's some other process that produces up to t errors. And that creates a string z. And z is also a string of length n. So the model we're going to use is that an error involves um, changing, corrupting one symbol to a different symbol. Okay, so at least in this uh, lecture, we're not going to talk about the possibility of errors that like insert a symbol or delete a symbol um, or somehow erase a symbol. We'll just imagine the uh, case where a symbol gets corrupted, changed to a different symbol. And uh, oftentimes, it's a reasonable model that encompasses some of the other models. And now what you imagine, this is the transmitter transmits, uh, well, y, the encoding of x, the message the transmitter wants to send. The receiver gets z. And now somehow we want to decode, ideally, this z and get back x again. OK. Uh, and uh, one, thing I, you know, I, one thing I said was that you, know, you think of the encoding process as taking the original string and like, adding some redundancy to it. It's, we're not actually insisting that the error correcting code be of the form you know, first transmit x and then transmit some additional redundant symbols. Y uh, might just be any old string that represents x. Actually, often it will be the case that the symbols of x will be a substring of y. In that case, it's called a systematic error correcting code, but we don't necessarily insist on that. And um, as I said, we're also going to work in this sort of uh, worst case model of errors. So we're going to have some fixed bound t, and we're going to imagine that, like, always, at most, up to t errors could get corrupted. Okay? And uh, an adversary could corrupt them in the worst possible way to try to uh, fool everybody. Any questions about this? OK. So uh, we want to think about like, what makes a good error correcting code uh, encoding function or a good set of code words uh, for the purposes of being able to do this last step. Take like, a potentially corrupted code word and figure out let's say, the y that it came from, which will then allow us to deduce the x that uh, y came from. So one definition we'll need for this is that of um, Hamming distance. So presumably you've seen this before. The Hamming distance denoted delta between two strings, y and z, is simply the number of coordinates on which they differ. The number of coordinates i, such that yi is different from zi. And now I'd like to try to draw a picture of uh, all these things we've talked about so far here. So let's imagine that this box here represents uh, sigma to the n, all possible strings over this alphabet sigma of length n. So this is all possible uh, things that a receiver could potentially receive. And I'm going to put these little uh, kind of uh, dots here. And these symbolize the code C. Okay, so these dots, each dot here is a code word in C. Okay, so we'll have Q to the K different uh, dots in this whole uh, space of Q to the N possible strings. And uh, what we're going to look at now, let's say if we have a particular Y here, you know, according to the scenario, we're imagining that like up to, when you transmit, like up to T symbols get corrupted or changed which sort of makes us think about these objects. These are like the Hamming balls in this space of radius t. OK, so it's t. OK, so this uh, circle depicts actually all the strings whose Hamming distance from y, which is called the center of the Hamming ball, is at most uh, t. Okay, it's a Hamming ball of radius t. And you know, we might imagine if this was uh, y was the transmitted word, uh, then the received word might be any, uh, I don't know, string z inside this Hamming ball. Okay? This is, uh, according to our assumptions, the thing that the receiver might receive. 
And now when in principle, we may ask ourselves, could a receiver figure out what the intended uh, message was? In other words, figure out what the uh, originally transmitted code word Y was. You see, this can happen uh, as long as this um, Z is not within distance T of a different code word. Okay, so what you should really imagine is drawing a, a hamming ball of radius T around every code word. Here's another code word, Y prime. This is a hamming ball of radius T. Uh, okay, and as long as all these balls surrounding each code word of radius T are disjoint, then a decoder can at least in principle solve the problem of given a Z, that's uh, you know, corruption or hamming distance T at most from, from some code word, figure out what is that uh, code word that it's closest to. We'll talk about algorithmic issues uh, later, but in principle it can do it. And you see what's required for that, for all these hamming balls to be disjoint, is that the, um, the centers, in other words, the code words themselves, should be sufficiently far apart. And how far apart should they be? They should be farther apart than 2t. Okay, so what you want to do, given a code, is look at all of the um, hamming distances between pairs of code words. We'll look at like uh, hamming distance between, let's say, y and y prime. And as long as this is bigger than 2t, uh, where t is the expected upper bound, or the, you know, the upper bound of the number of corruptions we'll receive, then we're in good shape. Whatever the received word z is, it uniquely maps to some uh, closest code word y. And then the uh, receiver can, at least in principle, determine what y was. OK, so that motivates uh, the following defi definition. If we're given a code, and we want to understand sort of how many errors t can we potentially tolerate while still being able to decode any um, corrupted received word, then it's governed by this minimum distance between any two code words. So we'll make a definition for this. This is one of the most important properties of a code. Uh, the minimum distance of a code which is denoted d, is just the minimum over all distinct y and y prime in the code, in the range of the encoding function, of the having distance between y and y prime. And uh, the fact that I just tried to convince you of in words is that this uh, process called unique decoding, in other words, the ability to take a received word with up to t corruptions and figure out the unique code word that it's closest to is possible for a given code if and only if uh, the error bound t is at most basically the minimum distance over 2. OK, so at least if we're not uh, concerned at first with you know, algorithmic issues like how complicated is it to encode strings, to decode them, and so forth, then it becomes sort of a commentarial question um, to think about you know, how many you know, strings can we pack into the set of all n-bit strings such that they're all mutually far apart. And uh, one idea you might have for this, you know, a common idea in... Uh, combinatorial situations like this to get a nice set of uh, strings that are all far apart is to simply pick them randomly. Yep? Uh, I think it's correct. Well, I mean, my idea is that it's correct with less than or equal to the floor of d over 2. What's that? Uh, well, let's see. If the minimum distance is, let's say, 3, so that like all of the code words are at having distance 3, then you can certainly decode uh, if and only if t is at most 1. So that checks out. If the minimum distance is 2, then, you know, so the picture is you have a code word here, a code word here, and there's a code word in the middle at distance 1 from each of them. Then, yeah, I suppose you cannot decode at all unless the number of errors is 0. So we better put d minus 1. Let's see, does that work? d is strictly less than... Uh, now, let's put d minus, d minus 1 over 2. Does that work? 3 should go to 1, and 2 should go to 0. 
OK, I think this is fine. Good. Uh, right, so as I was saying, uh, potentially one way to you know, get a lot of code words that are all mutually far apart is perhaps you could choose uh, this set of code words randomly. And that's not a bad idea. In fact, we'll talk about this towards the end of the lecture. Uh, the good thing about it is you do get a very good rate versus distance trade-off. Uh, usually I'll start just saying distance instead of minimum distance. One second. And uh, what's bad about it is, well, it's bad algorithmically. It lacks typically uh, efficient encoding and decoding algorithms. You know, for example, if k is uh, like 100 and q is 2, so there's 2 to the 100 code words, OK, you could imagine in principle just picking them randomly to be a subset of, I don't know, all strings of length 500. But how are you going to store them? How are you going to like figure out a mapping that maps a message to uh, a code word and so forth? Yeah, you can consider all these things. As I said uh, today in this lecture, and often in CS theory, we mainly consider just um, errors, corruptions, where one symbol gets changed to an arbitrary different symbol. So uh, we're not going to talk about deletions or insertions or erasures. 